want to get into today's topic. And um, there's two things that I looked at. One is the science of building certainty. And I use the word science specifically because science is defined as the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation, experimentation, and testing of theories against the evidence obtained. It's a long definition, but there is a science to certainty. Okay, and um, you know, uh, you know, if, if you were, you know, Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, um, Babe Ruth, and you know, you're pointing over there, you're gonna hit the ball over there. Let me ask you, do you think they're certain when they make those comments or when they show up for the game or Michael Phelps looking to um, uh, do a swim race, right? Like he would win by like thousands of a second, he would win, but I would bet that he was certain. And if you ever watched him before the, the uh, swim, he was in a, a advanced mental state. Um, anybody, anybody remember, yeah, I'm dating myself, I think it's probably six years ago that Phelps won all those gold medals. Anybody remember that? Yes. Of course. And do you think that he was, do you think that in the entire world that he was that much better than everybody else? Or do you think that he was, you know, amongst the best, but he just had the right attitude and he had the, he saw himself getting that gold medal before he ducked, dove into the water. Is that correct? He had, correct. He had a mental mindset. In his case, both. <laughs> I mean, but, but I mean, like, you know, I'm sure he has bad days, Bruce, and I'm sure other people are, are competitive to his uh, skills. Like, there's nobody can be up all the time. Da, the, da, 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 da. the difference is the certainty. So um, I, I looked at... Well, the um, mindset of certainty. Yep. I mean, I think mindset is part of certainty, Jay, right? Like, that's all part of that whole science of being certain. But to Jay's um, point, though, if you if you if you're not certain, it starts with the mindset because you you may not have ever won that gold medal. But at the end of the day, if you're certain you can, that that's the mindset piece that I think is important where Jay was mm -hmm. going. Right, and, and and part of part of being certain is also being prepared. Right, you need to be prepared to win, and you just can't wing it. Um, but three ways to build certainty. The first one is, and and these are more technical definitions, but I think they have practical relevance. Question and change existing beliefs. Evaluate whether your existing beliefs serve you, okay? For example, if you think you won't find a job, I'm gonna replace this with you. If you think you won't sell a house in today's economy um, because interest rates are high and uh, there's no inventory, does this belief serve you? Are you even sure it's true? Most beliefs are only thoughts that have simply been adopted without even exploring the reality of them. Is it safe to say most of our thoughts and beliefs are merely mirages of the mind? When a belief is changed, you go from doubt to certainty instantly. Now, if we were to, to have an honest assessment of um, agents in the industry and then agents in our organization, do you think the mindset of many agents is positive or negative? Anybody wanna you know, chime in here? I, I think it's majority positive, right? I hope. The, no, the mindset of 90% of the people out there are negative. <laughs> Ellen, I, Ellen, Ellen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with you on that, right? Because they're, they're looking at all the reasons why they can't succeed, correct? Absolutely. Well, I don't know that they're looking at the reasons they can't succeed, but I think that their anxiety is getting the better of them, that they're putting fear ahead of outcomes. And I think that they care probably too much about what other people think. And yeah. that's part of the fear factor of not picking up the phone. What are they going to think? They're going to think that, um, you know, I'm too salesy or I'm too whatever. There's too many twos. Like, I think that coulds, coulds are much more important than shoulds because it, it's much, um, it's a lighter word and it gives you possibilities where shoulds are, um, are kind of judgy and opinion based. So coulds, I think could, what could I do? And then do it and not think about it too much. Emily, after today, I want to, I mean, Ellen, after today, I want to go to must from could, right? Because we must. I, I, I'm going to do this. Right. I must do this. Um, and uh, I, I've seen people in the office have conversations, you know, around the uh, the conference room table saying, you know what, um, 
prices haven't really come down, interest rates are up, it's really not a good time to buy. Now, when you have when you hear people verbalizing that, um, what do, what do you think their success or what do you think vibe they're going to put out to a, a buyer? First of all, they're wrong. Rates are down. Well, I mean, they're up from they're up from a year and a half ago. So, like you know, rates are up. Prices really haven't dropped. There's not that much inventory. You know, uh, I'm telling my clients to sit on the sidelines for a year until the market corrects. I've heard people say that um, both in and out of our, our organization. Wow. And if, if that, those are words that come out of our mouth, okay, that is uh, undermining your whole business plan of what we do. That's and crazy. honestly, I don't, I don't believe it. I mean, even if rates were high and prices didn't come down, there are people who are... Um, just formulating new households, families, having new kids, downsizing that need to make a move and need to be able to rely upon our industry to serve them, okay? To make blanket statements like that, I think is a little bit um, dangerous. I know they would say, Ellen, that, you know, that's how I feel. I really think that the market needs to correct. It's gone up so much, blah, 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 blah. We need but to get I out of the office and get another job and, and don't bring that mindset in anywhere else because that is just going to bring people down all over. That's crazy. It's a, it's a, it's a contagion. Right. And, and I, I say that not to be critical of anybody, but I really believe that, you know, there's always a market, right? Um, and if somebody... Forget about like the economic side of it, because this is a business for us at the end of the day. For 95% of our clients, it's a place to live. It's a place to call home. And it has a much more significant meaning than whether or not they pay 3% more in the interest rate or not. Okay. And I can easily debate anybody, Ellen, and say, you know what? I, I understand what you're saying. The, the 2% interest rate, 3% interest rate was fantastic. However, Ellen, if we were looking to buy then, um, we would have had 30 or 40 offers on every property. I would not be able to give you the ability to have a home inspection and you wouldn't even have an appraisal contingency in many cases, okay? And, and I'm not just selling, I'm talking from the heart because I, if it's right for you to buy, my attitude should not influence your decision in a negative manner, okay? I need to be realistic, I need to be certain, I need to be honest and transparent. Bob, I have a question. What do you say to people who um, are saying, well, prices are going to come down? Um, how do you know that? History. Show them the history of the appraise of, of the appreciation. Well, 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 so so, so that, that's a great question. So if somebody says how prices are going to go down, I'd say that's an opinion. Um, you know, ironically, what did people think housing was going to do when, on uh, was it March? 10th of 2020 did everybody think the housing market was going to crash yes i think we all thought we were going to be without a job but the mindset was the housing market's going to crash maybe i'll go try to get a really good deal and was that the reality no so if somebody says i think prices are going down i might just ask them based on what lisa well and Bob, let's let's look at some evidence go ahead scott um, when people say the price is going to go down, I answer that you're right, they did. And it appears that they've stabilized. And now that mortgage rates are coming down, people are starting to get back into the market. Historically, summer is always the busiest time. People are trying to move. So now's the time to get in before they start going back up. And, and Scott, that is not a salesy pitch. That's a fact. Yeah. It's also right. a fact that the biggest real estate boom we had, the O. 2000 to 03 boom, unlike the one we just had recently, mortgage rates were six to eight percent then, and we sold more right. houses than we had prior to this past one. And and, and I think I, I think um, I'm even going to step out of the topic of three ways to build certainty, and I'm going to say that you know um, we have a economic obligation to ourselves and our family, but we have a moral obligation to our clients. To be honest. And within that moral obligation, we have to give them facts. And, and if somebody said, I think the market's going to go down, if I look around, I would say the market has stabilized. I think that's what you mentioned, Bruce or Scott, and that now is an excellent time to buy. And I've given up on predicting the future because the world has certain, um, the world has uncertainty in it. Like, you know, when is the Ukraine war, war going to end? Is China going to invade Taiwan? What's going to happen? All those things have some impact on our living here in the United States of America. You like uh, happen. 
What's that? Life happens. People die. Yes. People get born. People get divorced. People want bigger, better, and more. People want smaller and less maintenance. Life happens. Who cares what's going on in the rest of the world? Like, what do you want? We can so, get it. So, Ellen, we deal with the facts as they are today, right? And, and if, I, I was to, if I was to help you purchase a home, Ellen, and if interest rates um, went down in six months, what would you do? I would refi if it made sense for me. And then I say, what are they going to do for me to help me refi if I go with this particular mortgage company? Am I going to, what What will it right, do right. for so, me? So if rates go down, do you win or lose? I win. It's a win-win no matter what. Because I'm, I'm getting and, and, and if, benefits, I'm getting equity, I'm getting... I'm getting all kinds of things. I'm getting stability. I mean, there's so many more positives than negatives. And I just don't think that it makes sense to even entertain. Like, if people aren't ready to move, then... So I want to but... isolate it to two things, Ellen. Like, so if interest rates go down enough to make it economically advantageous, you refinance. And what would happen if there were external factors in the world that caused... Um, interest rates to go up to 10% and not go down below that for the next 10 years. How would you feel about locking in a rate of six and a half today if in the future the rates were up to 10? Are you going to be upset that you didn't get three or are you going to be glad that you got six and a half when the market's 10? Look, I bought it six and plus. I refied around four. We couldn't get it together for various reasons to get the two and a half. I'm still at four. I'm good. I'm only gaining equity and my house is only appreciating. Right. So, add, so, add this in, Rob. If rates go to ten percent, that would mean the economy is on fire, which means your appreciation would go up too. So you're going to make a ton on the property because that's the only way rates will go to ten is if we're humping and we're pumping and and and, and inflation's getting accurate, which which drives your value. Right. Yeah, so, so 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 um, our mindset, our certainty of where the where the the market is, our definition of who we are, uh, impacts the way that we behave. And it impacts the people who rely upon us to serve them in what I consider to be a very, very uh, high level, um, high level um, service or, or sector, right? Like, you know, other than maybe being a matchmaker and picking your wife, Bruce, like what else is going to influence your life more than where you live, right? Where you choose to live, whether you choose to buy this house or that. It's pretty significant, right? Working with the Remax Select Group. And it, and it transcends it transcends the commission check that that somebody would make, and and I want you to think about that piece. More so, importantly, Rob, you're not married to your house. If in two to three years you don't like it, you can move. I mean, that's the other part of that. It's like pick the best choice that you have with what you got, and then move forward in one direction or other. Just make a decision. Right, well, we're, we're in a much more personal uh, space than like a financial advisor, for example. And would anybody pick a financial advisor who says, well, if stock market goes up and down, maybe we just want to stay in cash. No, over time, you would be, that would be the worst thing you could ever do. Um, hey, so Rob, we, can I throw something in real quick? Absolutely. So uh, I'm Rob Dorso, Bob, Rob, whichever you prefer. I'm new to the company, um, but I've got a little bit of experience. I, I, uh, I started in real estate when interest rates had just come down from 18% to 12 and they were having parties in the streets. Um, I think that if you understand the history and you look at what interest rates have done over the years, um, it's really a very simple concept for people to grasp and, and, and it can be done in a very simple way simple language. A lot of you have mentioned these things over over the course of this meeting, but I, I think what, what it all boils down to is asking the right questions to your clients. I think that if you find out what's really important to them, I think you're going to find out that the interest rate is very low on the um, on the spectrum of what's important. I mean, bedrooms, bathrooms, schools, location 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 and all those other things well this is a trend this is a this is a trend we're going through i mean you know people were shocked when everything went went south on us inflation interest rates everybody's in the shock mode but what i tell my clients is that this is going to be the normal 
So expect it. You know, this is what we were used to before, six, seven percent. And like Rob said, if it goes to 10 percent, you locked in at six, you're going to be tickled pink. So but this is a trend and, and people have to get used to it. And that's what I just that's what I kind of pass on to them. All right. So we're, 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 I, I really appreciate your perspective here. And I want to just give you my um, take on what we're talking about here. Right. And, and I'm going to separate it from this particular topic, and I'm going to just um, talk in general terms. Do you think that the more you talk about an issue like interest rates, the more it becomes significant or the least it becomes significant? I think you got to know uh, your audience, but if it's significant so, to them, you help them get over it. But if it's not, no, I want to take, take, take the lender out of this year. I want to ask either uh, Rob Durso or Ron Piccolo who are in the conversation. So if I talk about if I go on a listing appointment, I talk about the commission rate a lot, right? Is that going to help me or hurt me? On That's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt me. If I go and I talk about what interest rates have done, is that going to help us or hurt us? It's going to hurt you. Correct. Yeah, so the more you talk about it, the more the more significance you give the subject. Exactly. Okay. And because it's something that's you know logical in our mind, if we feel the uh, need to talk about it, what we're doing is we're making it more significant than it needs to be. Okay. okay. If somebody's having a conversation and saying, you know what, um, you know, my wife and I were thinking about waiting a little bit until prices come down and maybe interest rates adjust, you know, we really feel like we missed the boat. You know, my next thing would be, you know, other than, you know, interest rates, you know, what else would be stopping you from making a decision on something so important as where you decide to live? What's stopping oh. me, Rob, is you're lacking a picture on your wall behind you and it's kind of driving me nuts. <laughs> I, I would phrase it differently, Rob, and say, how how could we get you moving forward to make a good decision rather than what's stopping you? Because they're hearing stop instead of moving forward. And I think that it's important to keep positive words because the choice of the weight of the word has meaning to the subconscious a lot. Words okay. are well, yeah, words are wrong. very, very important. I, I think uh, what we have to try and do is convince ourselves, those who are not convinced. Uh, if you listen to uh, Scott, he truly believes what he's saying. It comes across caring and it comes across concerned and looking out for his client's best interest. I think we have to stop putting negative thoughts in our minds right. and start thinking more positive. This is a good market. Um, like Rob, uh, the other Rob, I was in the market when it was 18%. Believe me, homes were sold, homes were bought. You have, to, you, have to, you have to turn your thought process to the fact that if you don't help somebody get the home they need today, Tomorrow, they're not going to thank you for it. But that's you know, also what happens if that house goes, the price goes up and the interest rate stays the same, but the price of the home is more expensive. Right. Rob? I don't see yes. them really going down much. All right. Jay? Speaking of certainty, with all of my clients, when people ask me what's going on in the housing market, here's what I say. The best investment you will ever make with your money is in real estate. Doesn't matter when, doesn't matter why, it is still the best investment. Always the best place to shelter your money, the best place to, okay? That's the great thing about our job is we can never be wrong about that, really. <clears throat> so, right, so and, 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 and Jay, I, I, I would yeah. make, I'd make a, a, a minor pivot there, Jay, where, um, you know, it depends upon you know what their objective is and then buying real estate transcends shelter right it becomes a good investment so like i i'm just cautious about you know just spurting things out without having reactions just like our listing conversation it's like you know they say what's your take on the housing market what you know i found for most of my clients both investors and um, people looking for a home there's a lot of unique opportunities in this environment. And then you can expand upon it by questions. You know, you might say, you know, most right. of the people, most of the people that I work with, especially when they're downsizing, have discovered the majority of their wealth remains in their home by making a good investment and having a place to live. 
Um, I think it's worth mentioning, Rob, if you if you're if you're also like for people on the call, so it's not just about a mindset and trying to be positive. The knowledge and 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 having some facts is where you're going to get that certainty. You you have to have the knowledge, and then you'll have certainty, and your your certainty, your knowledge should be on the you know the more outcome oriented things. But you 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 know it's not just about winging it. If we're all sitting here saying, "All I got to do is change my attitude," we have to change your attitude. We got to know what the hell we're talking about. We got to have facts. Yeah, we got to have focus on facts. Agreed, Bruce. You need to know how many are coming on the market. So when you're talking, if we're focusing on sellers, because as we're talking, sellers are the ones that are probably in the older, and they you they they remember those higher rates, so they shouldn't be afraid that there are fixes. That's the first thing. The second thing is that if we're focusing on facts and not opinions, then we should be able to work with both buyers and sellers and take our opinion out of it and meet people where they're at on their map of the world, not ours. If I can touch on this real quick, I just had an experience yesterday, a conversation with a client came in and it, 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 my dad was a huge believer in what you say will happen. Uh, manifest destiny, so to speak. And uh, I was speaking with him and he wants to buy a house. And he's like, oh, I also have a house to sell. And he's down in Jackson. And I was talking to him a little bit and he seemed a little hesitant until I said the words, I can do it. And as soon as he heard the words out of my mouth saying, I can do it, his attitude changed. And it was all he needed to hear to have more confidence in saying, yes, let's do this. So what you say does matter, but you back it with experience and knowledge. And, and Greg, you have Greg, you have a, a good demeanor in communicating, as do most of us here. But I think um, I'm going to say this: people don't care what you know or what you can do until they know that you care, right? So, like, if they if they smell commission breath on you, Greg, and you can even smell commission breath over a Zoom meeting, um, they're going to recoil and backtrack. But if they know that you have an abundance mindset and you're like, look, you know, if this is right for you, I'm the I'm the obvious choice. You're not saying that, but it's going to be heir apparent, right? And when you said that, you know, you, you, you what, were the, what was the language that you used with that individual? I can do it. I can, I love it. I can do it, right? And, and that wasn't arrogant. That was like, if you have a need, I can solve it, right? So, so um, you know, this theme comes back a lot, folks. Um, you know, nobody cares what you know until they know that you first care, right? But yeah. So, so the second piece, and uh, this, I love the interaction today. The second um, component to building certainty is to seek out new references, right? Uh, references are life experiences that you have acknowledged and accepted. Okay. If you have seen many marriages end in divorce, you'll have a reference that marriage doesn't work. If you've seen many loving marriages, you'll have a reference that marriages are blissful. Now, as you can see, this is not my own language, but I'm just putting this out there. If you have seen, um, references help determine certainty or doubt. References help determine certainty or doubt. If your references do not create a high degree of certainty, you have the ability to rethink what you think you know, to find new, more empowering beliefs. To act to achieve whatever you're committed to achieving. Now that's a, a lot of words, and I think you understand where I'm coming from. Like you can find examples why it's a bad time to buy a house. You can find abundant examples why it's a good time, and then you need to be the person that cares and helps somebody interpret whether it's the right time for them and their family. I think that's uh, important because I think the consumer or the customer is. Uh, it just like when he said, I can do it, they're looking for reassurance from us. So we're positive uh, to help them uh, reach their goals and get their desires uh, taken care of. They're going to see that and feel it. You have to, you have to really look at this from the heart. You're helping somebody achieve something that they really need and they really want. So we're doing a good thing. So when you put, when you start thinking in terms that you're doing a good thing and this is the right move for them, that comes across to them and gives them that security and that feeling that they want. They're with you because they want you to encourage them to do what they want to do. Yeah. Also, if uh, we have a fact that figures for them, 
you know, that would help them tremendously. That will help tremendously to have the, the staff, you know, for example, in Broward County, you know, last year we had almost 33,000 homes that they sold. So the, 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 the sky is not falling, that it's not falling. And then I would like to say a little story that I met this man who came from, from Italy, he went to Canada and he was in construction and he was buying a big track of land that he was uh, in Canada to build. But something happened in his offer and he was beat out by somebody else, beat eyed on him. So he lost the, 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 that big track of land that uh, he wanted to build. But that was a blessing for him because he was going to pay all his money to that big project. The market went down. Everything was selling off. Banks were calling him up because he had the cash in the bank. They want him to buy. And people said, are you crazy to buy in this market? Well, he bought so many hotels that he bought there in, the, in Montreal area that he became a millionaire because uh, he was buying on 30 cents on the dollar, 40 cents on the dollar, when everybody else was running away. So he took the calculator risk that the market was coming back. And certainly every market comes back. And uh, he wind up with all that big portfolio there. So, so, and so, so, so Tony, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase that to something that's actionable. And... You know, if you do the right thing, and if the right thing for him was not to overpay at that time, um, the big plan works out, right? So if you always take the adage of I'm going to do the right thing over trying to force that sale just to get a commission as the uh, person representing him in Montreal. So that person might have said, look, this, this one's just not going to happen. And then six months later, the market adjusts, and whoever was helping him buy property is probably... Um, piggybacked and made a, a fortune and became a millionaire themselves by doing the right thing. Yes, yeah, especially in this market that we have now, which, like Colleen was saying, I got into real estate in 83, where the interest rate was 14 17%, and everything adjusted, and the price, instead of being so high, is going to be lower than it's going to be, so people can afford, because uh, as long as you can afford the payment, that's all that matters. And then we know, like we have been talking about, you can always refinance later. You're not married to a loan. Many times, you know, we 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 have refinanced in our lives. So, so uh, Warren Buffett, who many people know and probably would respect, says, um, "Be afraid when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are afraid." And let me ask you: Do you think? Do you think there's a the majority of the people are trying to get, jump into the real estate market now, or do you think the majority of players are a little bit afraid? Afraid. Does anybody anybody feel that the majority of participate, participants in the housing market, especially for a primary resident, are um, greedy and confident in buying here now based upon the property value going up 20% in the next year? Is anybody in that reality? Yeah, right. So you, that. you mean people actively looking, Rob, or people that should be? Well, no. So, so a year ago, Bruce, do you think people might have thought if I buy a house now and I overpay, I'll yeah. be rewarded Absolutely. because the price will go up by 20 or 30% next year, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's when people were greedy and that was a time to be afraid. And now people are afraid is the time to be greedy. And I don't like the terms greedy but I would say to be uh, aggressive, right? Opportunistic, yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, Absolutely. to be opportunistic. Well, so, you know, you got to always look at opportunity. You know, if you look at negative, you never see an opportunity. But if you look at the positive side of it, you always find opportunity that you find. Yeah, and uh, and that's, like I tell the people now, I say, this is a great market. And they look at me <laughs> like I'm not. I say, no, this is a great market because you can go out and look and pick and choose the house that you want. Before, I had so many people, well, I'm buying this house because there's nothing else about. Oh, uh, I said, now you're going to be happy with buying the house that you really want, that you're going to stay in your home, that you're going to stay instead to be moving out the next three to five years. Right. So, so, so sometimes, you know, um, we talk too much about 
interest rates. We talk too much about things that are not going to be serving our clients and ultimately not serving ourselves. And um, I, I believe that, you know, now is an opportunity. You know, I, I don't think prices are going to be going up 10, 20 percent the next year. They might even have a modest adjustment. But if you're not buying it for a year or two, you're going to be in good shape. You're going to be glad that you made the decision. And we have a moral obligation to be the person that is the barometer of truth, the barometer of reality, so that people aren't afraid, right? Like the, you know, if somebody came to you um, in July of 20, let's say they came to you in July of, or January of 2022 when the market was still pretty hot and everybody thought things were going up a year ago. Were you confident that, hey, if you buy this house in a year, it'll be 15% more? I certainly was. And I thought that there was some um, speculative um, uh, impact on it, you know, because everybody wanted to be in it. Now it's over-exaggerated to the other direction. And I, you know, I am, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to be buying, because I was doing that example on Tuesday, I'm going to be buying some investment properties more than I have been because I now took a, an unemotional look at it and I feel very confident if I'm in it for five years or more, it's going to be a phenomenal investment, you know, and I think, you know, the times that we take the temperature, how many people think next year rates are going to, or prices are going to be lower. We might have a majority and I might be in that majority, but, people need to grow. but in five years, I think everybody's, you know, the majority or, or the, uh, everybody is going to believe prices will be higher. Doesn't matter. People need to move. So the, the third topic I'm going to talk about, then we're going to keep this conversation going, is ways to build certainty, okay? Um, be curious. The adage, same old, same old, does not create certainty. Be curious and seek out new information. Ask, what am I really concerned about? What are the stories that I've told others and others have told me that may not be true? What am I not exploring that would immediately eliminate doubt and instill certainty? Now, um, I don't know if this is the right point to bring this up, but there was a gentleman and I feel horrible. I can't remember his last name. I know his name was Anthony and he did a lot of business in Jersey City. He was initially a part-time agent um, and he grew up in Jersey City. He was passionate beyond belief about the future of Jersey City. And he had no right to be getting $800 million listings in high rises in Jersey City, but he had certainty. And I was so intrigued by Anthony and I would ask him, how do you do this, Anthony? You've, you were part-time, you know, you worked with Weikert before us, you sold one house in a year and a half, and now you're a rock star. Tell me how this happens. And I probably will never, I forgot his last name, but I, I don't forget what he did. He said, Rob, I always show up a half hour before I sit in my car and I visualize and meditate the, the whole experience and how I'm walking out of there with the listing and how I'm going to impress them on my knowledge, my passion and my skill. So that was the, um, you know, example where, you know, on paper, he had no right to get that. I mean, he wasn't doing it full time. He, you know, didn't have market share in Jersey City, but he had certainty. He believed in his product. Um, he visualized it happening. It's Michael Phelps is seeing him touch the end of the pool, you know, a uh, hundredth of a second quicker than the, the closest next competitor. And then it became a certainty. So there was no reason why he should have been that good. His listing conversation was not the best, but his uh, sincerity his passion and people knew that he cared. So, you know, the choice, you know, the decisions we make and the beliefs that we adopt are not, um, you know, they're not inherent. We have the ability to reevaluate and come up with different opinions that serve us well, right? Like empower, disempowering beliefs, okay, um, are not healthy. You know, it's, it's like, you know, given a virus to your client, okay, it's not good. Um, we can choose 
to be in an empowering state or we can choose to be in a disempowering mindset. Is there anyone that's going to challenge me on that or, or, or are we all, we all understanding how this works? Hey, uh, Rob, I want to apologize because I didn't know everybody can hear me screaming. People need to move, but obviously I'm passionate about it. It's Ellen. So right. I think that, uh, you know, obviously I'm really passionate but leaving people need to move regardless of what's going on. And that's like something that I scream and yell at myself to convince my, I'm certain of it. And I think the more you program, you have to program your mind regardless of what the, what's going on that you have to be in that mindset. And that's what you're trying to convey today. So I think that's what's really important. You have to program your own mind so that you're in a state that when you speak to people, you have to know what your state is, what their state is, and then meet them where they're at so that you can affirm that it's okay. They need affirmation, regardless of what they're thinking about the opinions. And that's where they're gonna move. It's gonna come from their subconscious and then it'll, force them to make a decision. And, so, and Ellen, Ellen, if you're wishy-washy, will anybody should anybody trust you? No, you have to have good Certainty. communication skills to have the confidence to be able to instill in them the confidence in you. And I think those things, and you have to be congruent. You have to be able to have those four core things. And you've seen me wear my core sweatshirt. It's communication, confidence, commitment to what you believe and what you do, and then the congruence to get it done. And those are the things that people are gonna understand and that you convey by, by your behavior and by your thoughts and your feelings. And that loop is what pushes people to make to take action. So, so I wanna, uh, Ellen, I wanna thank you and everybody for sharing. I wanna ask, uh, actually, I'll start with you, Ellen. Uh, how long ago did you buy your first house? Uh, 20, uh, 2003, it'll be June 20 years. Okay, now when you bought your first oh, well, house. My first house, yes. We bought a condo prior to that, and we bought our house with, um, with we bought our house with uh, six and something, six and a half percent and a nine percent bridge loan. So, so were, were, were you slightly afraid that you were maybe stretching too much when you Hello? bought that first house? No, because I knew where we were at. I knew exactly what I wanted. It took me we, it was actually, my story is actually relative to, to a lot of people because I was under contract uh, with somebody else, a yellow company that will remain nameless, that I was very upset with the way the transaction was going because anyway, I, I, I pulled that transaction. It took me about three to five weeks to find that house. And then overnight, I was like, screw that person. I'm finding a house tonight. I knew what I wanted. I knew how I wanted it. And I did. And I'm in that house 20 years later. So, you know, my experience has been a lot of times when people, you know, buy the house that's right for them, they kind of go to the edge where they're like, oh my God, how am I going to afford this? You know, I can think back to, you know, when my parents bought their vacation home, they were terrified. How can we afford this? This is crazy. And you know, we have an extra mortgage payment. You know, what if, uh, you know, uh, dad loses a job, you know? Um, and I find that a lot of times when people buy, especially their first purchase, they feel like, oh, this is really um, anxiety driven. You know, what if, you know, I'm, I'm kind of pushing to the outer limits. There's no question. I see it from my end all the time. No question. And, and, and myself personally. I mean, yeah. my husband was terrified. <laughs> my husband was okay. terrified, but okay. I was good. And, and we needed my house. You know, we sacrificed of the four things that you have to look at, which is right, like condition, location, money, time we sacrificed condition because i knew because i was an interior designer i was going to rebuild the house it took us i don't know 10 15 years 10 10 years before i started really getting into it and then another four before i actually did it but i knew so, so, so he was terrified so but but it worked out good right it worked out great i have an awesome view of manhattan and i'm still in my house and i'm going to be scraped off the floor like butter because i'm in a ranch so yeah i'm happy okay so, so the, the, the point that I'm trying to drive home here, and, and Bruce, thank you for chiming in, because you also deal with a lot of people on the financial side. Fear. They all have fear. They, they all have a fear level. But if you were to go visit them and drop off an apple pie Thanksgiving five years later, they're going to be like, Bruce, I can't believe I was concerned about this. This house is perfect. It appreciated. I refined it. And they all, they all say that at the time when we refined. There's no question. They were all scared. But 
you know, right. we're all afraid of things we've never done before. We have to be that educator to help them with their certainty that this is what happens. Talk about tax benefits. Talk about normal increases in income per year. If your income just increases 2.2%, this is going to feel like a layup in a year or two. It's scary now, but it, but at the end, it's it's what it is. Right. So, rents so, go but, up too. Rents go up too. I mean. Right. But, but so, so, so Bruce, we can, we can build a novel about all the reasons to buy, but that to me feels a little bit too much like selling, right? What we need to do is we need to, we need to be the um, the person that can have the. Um, hey, you don't sell it, but if the conversation comes up, to be able to have the tools to talk to them about it to help them with their fear. Well, well how about maybe even if we, we we rephrase it from selling to educating, right? So, like, if somebody says, "I'm afraid of this," hey, you know what? Um, you know, uh, I was all afraid I of this. That's, that's what that's I want, right. I just wanted to share with you some things, right? So uh, that's that, the key. Hey, that's Rob, the nuance. Yes. How about? Rob, how about this? If they didn't have a problem, they wouldn't need us. Our job is to find out what the problem is and then help them solve it. We help people do things they can't do themselves. So the education and the knowledge, once you find the problem, you, you attack it. And that's how we move forward. And that's what they appreciate about us. That's why they came to us. Bob, thanks for mentioning that. We had a conversation with three originators this week. It seems like every file we have right now has hair on it. And I ended yeah. up finding myself saying to them, thank God, because if there weren't files out there with hair on it, we'd have no job. So at the end of the day, Amen, you're right. Brother. We solve problems. Yep. And, and um, you know, uh, years ago, you know, before I really, and I'm going to say pre-2008 and post-2008, I had a different perspective on the industry. In other words, um, you know, I thought if somebody was coming into any town saying, I want to buy a three bedroom, two bath ranch, um, and they talked to 10 agents, they would buy that same house that they wound up buying with nine out of the 10 agents, right? That's like, all the agent does is identify the property that they want and put them in it. And now my perspective is so different, right? Because if we just become order takers, we don't have a job. Okay, we need to ask questions and we need to be a, a trusted, valued advisor, you know, that has the confidence and the integrity to tell them what they need to know, right? But what they need to know doesn't need to be negative. What they need to know is what they need to know, right? And if we do that and people know that we care, we know that they're putting, we're putting their interest ahead of ours. And like when you get your real estate license, you learn about the fiduciary responsibilities and you think all right well that i i read it i know what it means but when you really think about it th that fiduciary duty and people's awareness of that really is the difference between you know grinding it out in the business and having a thriving abundant career always doing the right thing you know um always imagine that everything you do somebody can see it and, and would you do the same decision if somebody saw what you're doing and that's a good barometer for life. So, um, you know, these are, these are great because the, the interaction is, is amazing. Um, and I've never once, even in 2008 or nine, when the market collapsed, thought about a different career. Okay, like, this is it for me. This is happening for a reason. Like, Aunt, like Tony said, the, uh, I lost my deal in Canada, but then I wound up buying a bunch more at a better price because it was my destiny, right? I didn't force it. You know, if we always have the certainty to take the right actions, the communication skills to understand that, you know, it's not all about us. It's about listening, asking better questions and giving them good advice. We're going to have abundant careers. We're going to have the best year. We're going to do better than we did in 2001, 2002. And there will be those of, among us here that will have their best year ever in 2023. And there will be others that won't. Hey, and, Rob, can I give you another little tidbit? Yeah. That I learned recently. We tend, most of us, tend to like warrior through life. You know, like as an archetype, we, we tend to warrior through life. And the higher archetype of that is a wizard. And there's a big difference between Genghis Khan and like David Carradine, if, for those of you who are old enough to know who I'm talking about, but, right? Like the warrior type that you can be very calm and you can, you can help people and you can get through, but like a warrior tends to like really power through stuff. 
And a wizard, like, will make magic happen, right? We tend to, like, attract things to ourselves. We tend to, you know, we, we find it for the people that if they get super clear, we can find for our buyers what they want. If it's for our sellers, we can kind of get, like, who do we want that buyer to be for you and, and get super clear about what the vision should be. And then it wizards just have a lot more fun. So if we could meld those two in a calm way that it, it makes it like we're not like so strag, stra, frazzled and straggling around and, and or, leading or, our clients in a better way. Or, or, or even some might say desperate. Right. You have when you have certainty, it's like the opposite of being desperate because you know where you're going. Right. Yeah, and I think, I think taking, have... taking assessment is important to, to, to take assessment on a on a regular <laughs> daily basis of like, where are you on the scale of one to two to ten or one to one hundred of am I am I feeling unsure or am I am I certain or am I not certain? You know, like, where am I on that scale? I mean, I think I mean, we need to think about when we had that great closing, uh, sellers were thrilled. The buyer was thrilled. Uh, the first time buyer, how excited they are to get their, their, get their home. You did that. You helped them do that. And I think you should put that feeling in mind when you're working with people. That's the That's feeling correct. you want to have. That's state first. That's state first. That's correct. So, so Colleen, um, you, you've been doing this uh, a long time and you would agree with me, I hope that all agents have different closing percentages when they go under contract. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Like some people, like they really have like 0.2% that fall apart and some people have 30% that fall apart, right? Exactly. Now, is that luck? Uh, no. It's not luck. Not Mr. at Durso, all. Mr. Durso, have you seen people with different closing percentages once they've gotten a contract, uh, something under contract? Absolutely. And Absolutely. Is, is it luck in your opinion or is it something beyond that? It's way beyond that. Way okay. beyond. And, and, and I'm going to, for sake of time benefit, you know, when people meet with clients, there's a certain number of people that, you know, if Bob Durso meets with 10 clients, you know, he might have seven under contract in a year and the other three probably it's not right for them or maybe two of them it wasn't right and one bought with somebody else. I'd bet I'm probably pretty close on those numbers. Other people might be the exact opposite. They might have one or two that buys with them, one falls apart, and that's their reality. And it's not about luck, okay? It's about the way that we build trust, we inspire confidence in our ability to do the right thing with our clients. And, you know, I want, I want to let that sink in, to take a, a phrase from Elon Musk, let that sink in, folks. That's the reality of it. Um, so we sometimes feel like we're victimized by the market or bad clients or bad decisions, but in most cases, you know, the solution is a mirror, not, not pointing the finger. Um, would you agree Remember, we're that? also the offensive court. We're like the coach of ourselves too. We don't just perform. We also have to take a step back and be our own offensive coordinator, our own coach, make sure we're doing the right things on the game plan because the fight thing about doing what you have to do, that's important. But if you're doing the wrong things, you might as well not be doing them. And that's, that's, I think that's where that wisdom and the certainty comes in that you were talking about. Just be an open sponge. When markets are like this, there's people that know how to help you get through them and just reach out for those people and surround yourself with those people too. That helps tremendously. And, and Bruce, I'm going to say something that might be controversial, but like if you don't feel comfortable um, transacting business in this marketplace, you probably should go into shelf. referral. Yeah, you probably shelf. should put your license into referral. And then when the market comes back, you can come in. If you but don't I believe think, it, you're dead. You're right. I agree. No, but, but, but in all honesty, I think that would be a disappointing um, commentary for your clients. But but I, I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. Like if you don't feel confident transacting in this market, you know, you might want to consider something else. And I, it's no offense to anybody, but like if somebody comes to you with a need, you know, we have this moral obligation to, to, to educate them. And if we're not confident, nobody's going to choose us. And we need to help those agents build their confidence, Rob. And I think that those people that are feeling not confident should work with somebody 
either their managers or come to training and start role playing and have those conversations so that they can develop their communication and confidence so that they can do it. Uh, and it's that cycle too. It's that it's that cycle that psychology talks about all the time, you know, the strong markets and all that. They create, you know, complacency or weaker folks. And then the weak markets is where the stronger stronger folks grow. And so this is that piece that to your point, if it's if you don't have the, you know, if you don't believe that and you're not ready to get through that, because you will flourish if you get through it. But this is one of those markets, man. It's different, it's tough, and there's a lot of knowledge and it does start with beliefs. But uh so I agree. If you can't if you don't if you're not up for it, then don't don't kid yourself. I so agree Bruce, with that. Bruce, if you're flying down to Florida and the pilot came on and said, I've been flying these planes for a long time, but we're gonna go through a hailstorm. It would be my first time. I've done it through uh, a simulator. Wish me luck. <laughs> I would, thought you were going to say if the pilot passed out, my first thought would be, I guess I'm going to learn how to fly a plane. No, but but, but, up but, there. but, but in all honesty, if, if a pilot was that honest and said that, you'd probably get off the plane, right? There's no question. Right? But if we, if we non-verbally communicate that, they're going to get off our bus. They're not going to, they're not going to be on, they're not going to be a raving fan. They're not going to. It, even worse, they may choose not to transact in a market that can change their life. But and you I'm, have to be willing to change your belief, too, as a sales professional. You have to be willing to, you know, there's nothing wrong with being honest if you're feeling discouraged. You're not sure. You don't have that certainty. You either get it so you can make the right decision or, or you know, move on or speak to somebody that can help you. It's not nothing wrong but not knowing what the hell to do in this market if you've never done it. So, to, so, my so, point, to my point, I'm the mother of a pilot. You don't know how important simulators really are, Okay. And the training really is until you really need it. And, and so get the training, do the role playing, talk to people who, you know, have a good mindset. I'm open. I know you're open. There's people out there that will help those people that are, are you know, having those, those um, doubts. So, so, so you I'm, guys have a class that, starting next week on all this to help yeah, everybody, we, a ramp yeah, thing. You know. Yeah, we, we have a ramp program, which if you want to invest in yourself, it's on our hub. If you don't know about the hub, contact your manager. Um, they can show you the hub. But I, I want to say something that I, I don't believe I said in a long time, but it's really appropriate here. And if you don't believe in yourself, when you meet somebody, it's unanimous, right? Because how can somebody believe in you if you don't have the inner confidence, right? We try to, if you try to, you know, use the old adage, fake it till you make it, I, I don't think people are going to, you know, I don't think people are going to uh, allow you to fake it till you make it. I think you need to have the confidence. If you're always doing the right thing, you're investing in yourself. You have to say, why would somebody ever not work with me? And if, if there's a reason why they wouldn't work with you, let's make ourselves better so there's never a reason for them not to work with you, right? So, I want to so, add to that. I think also energy. Like if you feed off, you know, doubt, if you feed off like negative energy to your clients, whether it's a seller or buyer, it's going to come back to you. So you always, when you speak to them, you have to believe in yourself, believe in what you're saying and, and give them that positive energy as well. Right. So Michelle, thank you for sharing it. And, and um, I'm going to just wrap it up here and I'll stay on for a few minutes if you have any questions, but I'm going to wrap it up by saying that if you have the skills, right, and you really care about the people you work with, okay, there, there is, it's going to be a lottery type of event where somebody elects not to work with you. OK, it's going to be that rare um, when that happens. I want to um, just make a couple of announcements for some upcoming um, act, upcoming things that are coming on the calendar. Number one is um, we're going to be piloting a program with our title company here where if you just let us know by copying marketing at landquest.com uh, and details will come out. We're going to be doing mailings for your new listings and for your um, just sold, and that will be a complimentary um, activity because of LandQuest and myself. We want to invest in you. Um, I also see Denise is on the screen, who is launching our company-owned We Insure program. And Denise, are you somewhere where you can talk for thirty seconds? Yes, Rob, I am. <laughs> So Denise is, a, Denise is a real person. I've known her for 25 years. Um, I can tell you I have the ultimate amount of trust in her ability. And I know that she will do everything she can to serve our clients. 
And um, this is another business that's going to help us to help you more by making us more um, financially viable and doing right by our clients. So it's another one of those win-win scenarios. Her info is right here. Um, lenders and agents, uh, I'm not asking you to do it because it um, benefits Denise and Rob or Denise and the company, but I, I believe it's going to be a great value add to our clients and it's going to help us to be more aggressive in our growth pattern. And lastly, I want to just promote the RAMP program. Um, it's a $300 investment with Bro Workman. You get your money back if you complete the class. That means I'm paying your $300 because I believe in it. It's 10 uh, live in-person sessions where you know we've invested in trainers learning the material so they can present it to you to add more value to your clients. It's about structure in your life. If you do the structure, you have the right mindset, you have the confidence. Um, everybody on this call can be doing 10 million or more. Everybody on this call can minimum 2x their business in the next 12 months. And I'm not telling you that um, to get you hyped up on something that won't happen. I'm not telling you that um, to falsely inspire you. I'm telling you that because I believe it. If we do all the right things, we help our clients, we have the confidence, we will be unstoppable. Let the rest of the real estate community believe we're in a bad market. It's a choice that we make on how we proceed in this market. So, you know, I love all you guys and girls. I am so thrilled to be working with such a talented group of people sharing um, their experiencing so that we could all be a whole lot better. So I'll stay on for a couple minutes if anybody has any other questions. Um, if you don't, if you have any uh, critique of it, I'll get big shoulders, I'll take it. Rob, I got a question. <clears throat> Michelle had brought up something about, uh, you know, uh, the, your frame of reference and your vibration when you're, uh, when you're with a person. Um, if you're dealing with a person that's got negative energy um, and it's coming at you, is there a specific set of <laughs> tools that you can utilize to get around that? Um, so... You know, sometimes, sometimes negativity, Anthony, is a defense mechanism, okay? It's not the reality to it. And it, if, you, if you are the bigger person, and, th and this, is, this is not just in a client experience, but if you're a bigger person and you see beyond the, the, the details or the immediacy of the negativity and you look beyond that, I think you'll find that um, everybody has a positive side and that you can make a decision whether or not you're a good fit to work together um, because that's, that's the way that we transact. Anthony, I do have a specific technique that I, that I learned that does work a little bit at a time because as you can tell, I'm not exactly a negative guy, but there is a technique I learned that you might find helpful and it's like, like reflective therapy based and it'll be, you know, if, if Rob's spilling out something negative or whatever and to say, you know what, I, I know how you feel. Many people have felt the same way but what I've found, it's that segue. You can laugh, you can say whatever you want, but when you acknowledge no, the person. I'm, and I'm you, not laughing at you. I'm laughing at how appropriate it is. Right. And so, it's but what, what I found, and then you could shift the conversation a little bit, Anthony, to have that conversation and see if, to Rob's point, there's another level of where they go, whether they're just meatballs. At the end of there the day, some go. people are just meatballs. It's as simple as that. Yeah, but that's a no, good segue that I learned a, a long great, time ago. That's a great one. That's a, that's a great one, Bruce. Thank you. Right. And, and, and Anthony, the last piece about that is if somebody is negative, right, it takes two people to have a communication. You know, if you're the dominant positive person, you can influence the way that they behave as well. Any other questions? Does anybody feel like they're going to be positioned to do a little better this year, at least from their mindset? And then we're going to make that mindset into a reality. Definitely, because there's less people that will too, less competition. They're all going to get scared and run. Let them run. Absolutely. Let him run. As a, Let him run. As a run new far. guy, as a new guy in the group, and uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity. I, I have to tell you that um, I've been dying for this because like-minded people help each other grow. Um, you know, if you want to know where you're going to be in a couple of years, look at who you're around. And uh, I've been thriving, uh, lead, needing this looking for this and I, I just want to thank everybody for their positive input and and uh the motivation you can't help but want to do great things so uh i'm looking forward to working with all of you thank you 
Um, Rob, it's from the heart and the mind. And I'm going to leave it at that because that's what really drives us. And I truly believe and I'll uh, walk a mile with you that this year can be 2x of what your last year was. And the only thing stopping you is your mindset and your discipline. So everybody have a wonderful production. Hey, Rob, weekend. real quick. Eric here. Thanks, yes, Rob. Sir. So what is the ramp? So ramp is called Rising Agent Mastery. And it's basically a playbook for um, new and experienced people to get the discipline to do the things that we all know that we need to do. And Eric, you're a uh, very seasoned, experienced professional. <laughs> um, but sometimes sometimes the fundamentals and, and revisiting them have value. So I wouldn't dismiss it um, because of that. And your team members might find tremendous value in it as well. Um, either Fazia or Ron can get you more details if you give them a buzz. Yep. In the chat, we have included the information. And, and I, I believe in it and I stand behind it and... and you know, if, if the material is 92%, the best material out in the marketplace, I'll take it. And, you know, the, the impact of it's going to depend upon, you know, our mutual commitment to doing it. All right. Uh, for, for experienced people, look at it as a little bit of a refresher or a boost. Yep. I think we all need to do that sometime. And accountability. Absolutely. There's an accountability piece to it as well, where you guys are going to be accountable to each other as well, from what I understand. And, and then, you know, for, for Eric or any team leaders, um, we have a um, Monday morning, 8.30, team leader accountability call, which is exactly 30 minutes. And that call is 2% Rob and 98% team leaders sharing great ideas on how they can serve their team members and their clients better. Um, I think two weeks ago, I, I got a, a um, message from that meeting that, I probably won't forget for a really long time. And it was a team leader who was holding his team members accountable. And for the first six months, they scratched and screamed and clawed. And um, in December, they got 12 listings for 10 team members, which is way better than the average, way better than the average for our full-time agents. And uh, this team leader said, accountability is love. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that the people that stayed there understand that he was holding them accountable because he wanted them to be all they could be, not because he wanted to juice his own numbers. And there's a difference. So accountability is love. If you run a team or if you just run your own business, you're holding yourself accountable is, is a way of loving yourself and your clients so that you can do better. Right. So I'm, I don't, I don't make anything off of it. It's not a uh, income generating thing. It's, it's an expense item for me. And I'll gladly reimburse you for it if you do it because I believe in it. And, uh, you know, if you want to make that time investment, that small financial investment, you know, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. If there's no other questions, I'll wrap it up. Any last questions? Rob, Denise, I just wanted to um, offer to anyone, they can call me directly uh, for any of the insurance needs that they might have or for their um, customers, buyers and sellers, but just call me anytime. I will always make myself available to assist you. Thank you. Rob, can I say one thing too? Quick question. Yep. Quick thing. We also introduced a deal rescue desk where if you guys have some uncertainty about a transaction that's going on, if you're a little worried that you seem squirrel at the other end or something's up, reach out for me. Give us a call. Reach out bruceover.com. We'll get you in touch with the right lender. And if we have to, we'll get the file. We'll take the appraisal and we'll get it closed in 15 days. So if you have something like that going on, feel free to give me a call. We might be able to help you. Um, Ron, quick question. It would be great if we can get the information for our partners, the lenders, the insurance company um, that we most uh, work with so that we can use that information on our marketing, marketing materials. I have a, a friend that in all her um, flyers and postcards, she puts down um, the partners that her office works with. You know, she works with another agency, not Remax. Maybe she'll join us someday. Um, but it's, um, it's pretty welcomed by the people that she gives out that information because she has a whole team behind her. She's not only the listing agent, the selling agent, but she introduces them right away to the lenders, the insurance company, the inspectors, uh, the movers, 
Um, so if we can get that information for the, you know, the ones that, that we use. I, I will say if you just call me off, I'll be glad to get you the affiliate information. This is Brian. Yeah, and, and, and Brian, um, and you, some reason you had a really bad background with Brian, but Rosa, one of the things is like we're, um, we're opening up our own title company um, in uh, Southeast Florida. Um, we're trying to assimilate um, cultures very uh, deliberately and slowly. So we will be putting this information out to you. And I do appreciate that, um, that comment because we will be getting it out to you as things come together. Because right now we don't have the, we ensure operating in Florida, we're working on those details. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we'd love to have everybody um, given a resource that is reliable. And any of the ones that we stand behind, you know, you can call me on my cell phone directly if you ever have an issue. And I get very few calls because we vet out our partners. Um, but it's, it's a true, you know, what I don't want is to call me after I can't help fix it and complain. That's off limits. Like, you know, this, they missed the commitment. It didn't close on time. And you're telling me two months later when I can't make a call and get it fixed to, to everybody's satisfaction. So I am so excited about this year. Um, you know, the, dial, the dialogue we had together is even more empowering to me. And you choose whether you're going to have the best year ever or not. It's all in your hands. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.